All right, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. These are all on the videos. Uh, 14, 13. Wow, I bet there's almost nothing left. Ah, number 11, we haven't done that. So let us do that. Number 11. X minus eight equals the square root of x minus six. Okay. Well, this is a radical equation and the strategy for this is that as long as the radical is isolated, I square both sides. The first step would be uh, if you have like a plus two over here to move it over there so that the radical is isolated. But I don't have. OK. Let's square both sides. So I will have X minus eight times X minus eight equals x minus 6. Now x squared minus 8x minus 8x plus 64 equals x minus 6. So x squared minus 16x plus 64 equals x minus 6. OK, we're going to be solving a quadratic equation. So we need to have a 0 over here, and that will happen if I subtract x from both sides of the equation and add 6 to both sides because, I'm going to explain it. Look what happens. X minus X is zero. And negative six plus six is zero. And zero plus zero is zero. So now I have a zero over on the right hand side. Here I'm going to have X squared minus 17x because there's an invisible one in front of that. If I've taken away six x's and then I take away another x, I have taken away 17 x's. Meanwhile, 64 plus six is 70. Okay, so we will have x squared minus 17 x plus 70 equals zero. Now, I have to either factor or use the quadratic formula. As it is 70 equals seven times 10 and or negative seven times negative 10. And if I add negative seven plus negative 10, I will get negative 17, which is my B number. So that is the correct combination, negative seven and negative 10. Because of the invisible one in front of X squared, I can use the easier method of grouping. Split the X squared apart. 
and use these factors in the following way. Minus 7 minus 10. Now I set each factor equal to 0. x minus 7 equals 0, and x minus 10 equals 0, and I solve for x and solve for x. So I'll add, <clears throat> if I add 7 to both sides, I'll have negative 7 plus 7 equals 0, so that X is all by itself over here and I have to have a drink of water. <coughs> okay. I will bring down my equal sign. Zero plus seven is seven. Same thing over here. I have to isolate X. So I will add, add 10 to both sides of the equation. The reason being that negative 10 plus 10 is zero. That leaves me with X on the left and zero plus 10 on the right. <coughs> so I have 10, I have 10 answers. I have two answers, seven, and 10. Now, the most common wrong answer that my students give me on this kind of problem is they just say, okay, the solutions are 7 and 10. Well, maybe it's true and maybe it's not. You don't know. One of them or both of them may be extraneous. Those extra answers you can get when you square both sides of an equation that don't have, that are not solutions to the first line. So you have to check. Let's try x equals 7 and x equals 10 and do some old fashioned checking that all of us hate. OK, if X equals 7, I will get a true answer here. Let's put the original line up here. All right, 7 minus 8 equals the square root of 7 minus 6. 7 minus 8 is negative 1. The square root of 7 minus 6 is the square root of 1. The square root of 1 is 1. So we have negative 1 equals positive, raw, uh, positive 1, which is absolutely wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. But I don't write the word wrong. Instead, I write the word extraneous. The first part is extra, E, X, T, R, A, extra, and we turn that into extraneous. There you go. Ne seven is an extraneous solution. I wasn't wrong when I got it. I did everything right but it's an extra answer we got because we, saw, we squared both sides of the equal sign. Sometimes you get an extra answer and sometimes you don't. You never know. Now we're going to try X equals 10. 10 minus eight the square root of 10 minus 6. 10 minus 8 is 2. 10 minus 6 is 4. So we have the square root, the principal square root of 4. And we'll get 2 equals 2, which is true. 
And so that means that X equals 10, or 10 is the only solution. So seven is extraneous, 10 is the only solution to that equation. Be very careful when you solve a radical equation. No matter how many radicals are in the equation, be careful and check your answers. Okay, that was number 11. So let us be done with that. Ah, hmm. uh, yeah, let's let's not mark through something because again, these are opaque. And I have to remember that over here, the markers are not opaque. OK, we've done 11. Oh, fun. Let's do 9 and 10. Rationalizing the denominator. That was a bit of sarcasm when I said, oh, fun. All right, let's do number nine. Because exactly how you rationalize, the method you use will depend on the kind of denominator you have. Here we go. We are going to rationalize. the square root of 15 divided by two. Doesn't look too hard and indeed it is not hard. The trick here is to recognize that the square root of 15 over two is the square root of 15 over the square root of two. The square root of two is a radical term and you have it in the denominator and that's not allowed. So we have to multiply by one because when you multiply by one, you do not change what you're multiplying. I mean, one times three is three, one times the square root of 15 over the square root of two is the square root of 15 over the square root of two. But one can be used to change the form of what's being multiplied, and that's what we're going to do. The form of one that I plan to use is the square root of two over the square root of two. Well, why would I do a silly, stupid thing like that? And the answer is that when I multiply the numerators together, I will have the square root of 15 times two underneath the radical. And when I multiply the square root of two times the square root of two together, I will have two times two underneath the radical so that I will have the square root of 30 over the square root of four. And everybody knows the square root of four is two. So the answer we want is the square root of 30 over two. Can you divide 30 by two? No, because the two is not inside a radical. These guys can't talk. The square root of 30, square roots, any kind of roots are like, are like um, um, the isolation cell in a, in a prison or or the isolation ward in a in a hospital. 
The people outside cannot touch or talk to the people inside. Same thing for numbers. If 30, if 30 is in prison, then the most two can do is talk to him through a window. I mean, they're not going to get together. This is the answer. And if I had time, I would prove to you, well, why not? I suppose I have all the time in the world. Here. I am going to find, let's clear, the square root of 15 divided and just hit enter and I get that ugly number. Now, the square root of 30. Notice that I hit the right arrow key to move to the outside of the radical sign and then I divide by two. Enter. Same exact number. They are the same number, just in different forms. And this form, with a rational number on the bottom, is preferable in, for many things, is preferable to this form where you have a square root of two on the bottom. You can do more with a two that's not under a radical. Like, oh, I don't know, add and subtract. So that's why we rationalize denominators. Okay. Save. And that was number nine. Now on to number 10. Better see what it is first, huh? Number 10. This is harder because you have two terms in the denominator and one of them is a radical. There is only one method that works. Uh, that's a two. So I do have to write it correctly to get the right answer. Math problems are funny that way. OK, now notice what the answer is going to be. OK. Now again, I'm going to multiply by one. In the form of the following. The conjugate of this over itself. So three plus the square root of two over three plus the square root of two. And because we're going to be multiplying the numerators and denominators together, it would be, I have found for me anyway, it's uh, simpler or at least more understandable, quickly understandable, if I put parentheses around these binomial terms, because they are one thing. Okay, I'm going to take four times three plus the square root of two. Over. 3 minus the square root of 2 times 3 plus the square root of 2.
Now, I was taught to never multiply or almost never multiply the tops together. I mean, to um, to go any further than this, to leave them in factored form. However, the answer does not do that. Which I find a little annoying. But oh well. So I am going to distribute there and there. So I will have 4 times 3 is 12 plus 4 times the square root of 2 over. Now watch this. I know that I am multiplying conjugates because that's the way I set it up. When you multiply conjugates, you can do this. Take the first term and square it minus the second term squared. The first term is 3. The second term is the square root of 2. You can only do that when you multiply conjugates. OK. Now, I'm just going to come down here. This isn't going to change now. 12 plus 4 times the square root of 2 over 9, 3 squared is 9, minus the square root of 2 squared is 2. So our answer is going to be 12 plus 4 times the square root of 2 over 7. Now let's see if it is right. Yes, it is. So you can rationalize a denominator that only has one radical in it whether it's one radical term or two terms, one of which is a radical, or two terms, both of which are radicals. And now we've done 10. Hmm. All right, now let's see, what else do we have to do? Ah, uh, simplify by factoring, number seven. The square root of 45, well, it helps if you know your times tables. If you do, you can just say, well, this is 9 times 5, and 9 is a perfect square, so the square root of 9 times the square root of 5 equals 3 times the square root of 5. That's it. That's all there is to it. Now, suppose, though, you don't know your times tables, what are you going to do? Well, there are a couple of ways to deal with it. Um, for instance, you can take the number 45 and start factoring it. You know that 5 goes into 45 because of that 5 on the end. So if you divide, if you take your calculator and divide 45 by 5, you'll get 5 times 9. Now 5 will not factor because it's a prime, and if you try to factor it by anything, you will soon discover that you can't. Except the number 1 and the number 5, that's it. 9, on the other hand, you find factors into 3 times 3, and 3 doesn't factor into anything smaller except 1 and 3. So, there we have it. All right. B 
because of the invisible to index, that means you're looking for one number that repeats twice, and here it is. So now you know that three times three is a perfect square. So you can take the square root of 45 and let it equal the square root of three squared times five, which is the square root of three squared times the square root of five and the square root of something squared is just the thing itself when it's positive. Times the square root of five. Okay. Um, There you go. There's number seven. Number five. I think we did, but I'm not sure. So let's do it again. Can't hurt. And then we'll do number four. Kind of work backwards. Okay, number four. I'll have to break this video down into two parts. What am I doing? That's what I'm doing. All right, we've got f of x equals x squared plus five, and we want to find the difference quotient, which is this right here. So you have to use steps to get there. People who try to do this all at once in one step always get it wrong. So we're going to do this in steps. The first thing we're going to do is find f of x plus h because we're dealing with trying to find f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So I better darn well know what f of x plus h is. So here we go. All right, x plus h quantity squared plus five. This is a binomial squared, so I'll say x plus h times x plus h. And if you know the formula for squaring a binomial, feel free to use it. I've seen too many people make mistakes trying to use it, so I don't even teach it anymore. x squared plus hx plus hx plus h squared plus five. Add the hx and the hx together, we'll have x squared plus two hx plus h squared plus one. Five, where'd the one come from? Why on earth did I do that? Five, five. This is what f of x plus h equals.
OK, now we know what this is. We know what this is. Now we can subtract these guys. Forget the H for a moment. The H down there. We'll get to it. But first, let's let's just go in steps. F of X plus H minus F of X equals X squared plus 2HX plus H squared plus 5. That's what F of X plus H is. I'll even write it small up here, F of X plus H. Minus F of X. Which is X squared plus five. That's what F of X is. Okay. Very important to use parentheses because you're going to have to distribute that minus sign to both of these terms. That'll turn them both into negatives, the opposite of what they were. So we're going to have x squared plus 2hx plus h squared plus 5 minus x squared minus 5 equals. And then we combine like terms. My favorite part, because I get to mark out terms. x squared minus x squared is 0. And 5 minus 5 is 0. So, what f of x plus h minus f of x equals is 2hx plus h squared. Not bad at all, huh? Okay, so... Now we can do the whole difference quotient. F of X plus H minus F of X over H equals, well, we just found out, 2HX plus H squared is what f of x plus h minus f of x equals over h, but back in beginning algebra, when you learned about polynomial division, when you divided a polynomial, here it's a binomial, by a monomial, this is the way you did it. And this was the correct way that will get you silly things like right answers. h squared is h times h, so we'll, when we put it over h, that makes canceling easier. We now are going to cancel the h's. We cancel this h, we cancel these h's, and what we're going to be left with is 2x plus h, where h is a very, 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 very small number. If you're the scientific researcher or the financial researcher, you'll know what H is. Your computer will know what H is. So you don't have to bother with it, we just call it H. And that is the difference quotient telling you how fast whatever this represents in your line of work, how fast things are changing that you're trying to measure, which is the value of this. If you've ever had an economics class, this gives you 
the marginal cost, marginal profit, or marginal revenue, marginal this, marginal that, that's where you find your margin right there. Very, very important. Okay, now this was number four. Let's save it and we'll go on and finish this up so you can hopefully make an A on the test, which would be delightful. Okay, so we've done four, five. That was five. Ooh, that was five, not four. Five. Well, what was this? Seven. Six. We did that the first day. Okay, and, and it's on video. All you have to do is go to module 10 and look. This is the 10th week of the semester. That's why it's in module 10. OK, so now we've got a ball being thrown up. See, it's going a little up. And then down. From. A site of 768 feet, maybe it's a building. All right, its height in feet after T seconds is given by this function right here. After how long will the ball reach the ground? This is so easy, you're going to be embarrassed. OK, we've got H of T, the height of the ball after a certain number of seconds. That's what time is. Equals negative 16 T squared plus 32T plus 768. And we're being asked to find T, how long it will take the ball to reach the ground. So I have to calculate how far above the ground is the ball when it hits the ground, and uh, that's zero. So zero equals negative 16 T squared plus 32 T plus 768. Now don't just jump into solving this, like throw everything in the quadratic formula. What we need to do is factor out a GCF if there is one. And since the leading coefficient of the leading term is negative, our GCF is going to have to be negative. But first, don't worry about that. First, let's see if 16 will go into 32. It will. And into 768, I have no idea. So I'm going to get the calculator. 768 divided by 16. Woohoo! It does. So now, 48. How will I remember that? I'll make a note. 768 divided by 16 equals 48. Okay, cool. Now, I have to rewrite this so that it's easy for me to take negative 16 out of each term. Zero equals negative 16 T squared plus, that's a positive 32. That means I'm going to have to have negative 16 times negative two T. Negative 16 times negative 2 is positive 32. Plus negative 16 times negative 
48. Now I can pull out a negative 16. Notice that negative 16 times negative 48 is positive 768. Okay, I am going to pull out negative 16 and write the leftovers. I'll wait and see where it ends. T squared plus a negative 2t, that's minus 2t, plus a negative 48, that's minus 48. Now what I should have done first, as soon as I wrote down negative 16, I should have marked out all my negative 16s to make sure I don't get mixed up. So t squared minus 2t minus 48, okay. Now, because it's an equation and I can do anything I want as long as I do it to both sides of the equation, I can divide out my GCF as long as it's a number. If that were a variable, I couldn't do it. Okay, so the negative 16s cancel out here and zero divided by negative 16 is zero. So zero equals t squared minus two, t minus 48. So now. <sighs> 48. Forgetting the sign for a minute. 48 equals. 1 times 48, 2 times 24, 3 times 16, 4 times 12, 6 times 8, that's it! Okay, negative 48, will equal one times negative 48, two times negative 24, three times negative 16, four times negative 12, five times negative eight. I need to go no further because six plus negative eight equals negative two, which is precisely what I have here. So zero equals, there's a one in front of that T squared now, so I can use the quicker form of grouping. Take T squared, split it apart here and here, and then take these factors plus six and minus eight. And because they're set equal to zero, I set each factor individually equal to zero. Okay, six minus six is zero. So T is left alone over here. And zero minus six is negative six. Negative six seconds, I don't think so. Over here, I'll have T minus eight equals zero. To get T by itself, I will add eight and add eight. Negative eight plus eight is zero. So T equals zero plus eight, which is eight seconds. That sounds great to me. So the answer should be eight seconds. In eight seconds, yes, woo! In eight seconds, this ball 
will hit the ground. Okay, we have done four. We still have three and two and one to go. Number three, you should be well aware of is the difference of squares and breaks down into V plus three and V minus three. So I am not even going to go over that. This on the other hand uh, is factoring by the AC method. So we definitely have to do that. That is hard. Number two. Factor. Forty oh four A squared plus B one A plus five. Cool. Well, I am going to let four equal capital A, twenty one equal capital B and five equal capital C, and we're going to factor this with the AC method because we do not have a one in front of the A squared. It gets more complicated when a number other than positive one is in front of your A squared. Well, is in front of your quadratic term. It's not a good way to say it. When the leading term is not positive one, factoring gets more complicated. There you go. Okay, so A times C is four times five, which is positive 20. And I need to factor 20 into two numbers that will add up to 21. And what occurs to me immediately is 20 equals 1 times 20. Because 1 plus 20 equals 21. Oh, how often do you get it that simple? All right, so we're going to have 4a squared and then plus 5. They don't change. But in the middle, in the middle, I'm going to break down 21A into plus 1A plus 20A. There. Now, I put parentheses around the first two terms. Keep that plus in the middle and parentheses around the second two terms. And then I take a GCF out of the first two terms and a GCF out of the second two terms. So both of these terms have an A. And I'll be left with 4A plus 1. And both of these terms have a 5. 20 is 4 times 5. So both of these terms have a 5. I pull out the 5, and I am left with 4a plus 1, because 5 is 5 times 1. So if I mark out the 5s, I'm left with 4a plus 1. Now 4a plus 1 occurs on both sides of the plus sign, so it becomes the GCF. And the leftovers 
If you now mark out 4a plus 1 and 4a plus 1, you have an a plus 5 left. And now you really should check your answer to make sure it's true, however it is. So we're going to skip that because this video is going on forever. Finally, we're at number one. And we're doing fa uh, function arithmetic. We've got f of x, we've got g of x, and we're being asked to find g minus f of x. Well, we're going to do that. If f of x is negative 3x plus 5, and g of x is x squared minus 2. Oh, let me make sure I remembered that correctly. x squared minus 2, yes. Okay. We're being asked to find g minus f of x which is g of x minus f of x. So, g of x is x squared minus 1, uh, x squared minus 2, and f of x is negative 3x plus 5, So we're going to have x squared minus 2. Now, minus times negative 3x is plus 3x. And minus times positive 5 is negative 5, or minus 5. And so, we are going to have, putting this in the correct order, and combining like terms, minus 2, minus 5, we're going to have x squared plus 3x minus 2 minus 5 is minus 7. And let's check and see if we're right. x squared plus 3x minus 7. Yes, we are. Okay, we've done one. Now let's look at any that may not have been done. Twenty four, twenty five. Oh, yeah, I did twenty two and twenty three today. All right, gang. Every single problem on the practice review has been done for you either yesterday or today. And by the end of the day, you will find the um, the recordings and the notes in module 10. And I am going to take a break until my office hours at 3 p.m. Now it's time for you to study hard. So I will see you tomorrow. Um, and I'll just be sitting here waiting for any questions. Thursday, we take up new material. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.